Welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast, an exploration of the idea of curiosity and its increasing importance for thriving in the digital age from the authors of The Curious Advantage. Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Curious Advantage podcast. This series is about how individuals and organizations use the power of curiosity to drive success in their lives and businesses, especially in the context of our new digital reality. It brings to life the latest understanding from neuroscience, anthropology, history, business, and behaviorism about curiosity, and makes these useful for everyone. My name is Simon Brown. I'm one of the co-authors of the book, The Curious Advantage, and the Chief Learning Officer at Novartis. And today I'm here with my co-authors, Paul Ashcroft. Hi. And Garrick Jones. Hello. And we're delighted to be joined by Michael Bungay Stanya. Michael is at the forefront of shaping how organizations around the world make being coach like an essential leadership behavior and competency. Uh, his book, The Coaching Habit, is the best selling coaching book of this century, uh, with over a million copies sold and over a thousand five star reviews on Amazon. In 2019, he was named the number one thought leader in coaching, and he was shortlisted for the Coaching Prize by Thinkers50, which is the Oscars of Management. Michael hosts a popular podcast show, We Will Get Through This, and he's the founder of Box of Crayons, a learning and development company that helps organizations like Microsoft and transform from advice-driven to being curiosity-led. We'll hear more about that. Welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast, Michael. I am so happy to be here. If there was a a podcast that I most wanted to be on, it's probably this one. So it's very exciting for me. You focus much of your career on curiosity and it features extensively in your books. Uh, I've heard you describe it as a leadership superpower. So let's start with what is it about curiosity that interests you? It's a great question because so often with curiosity, it kind of has a bit of a warm, fuzzy, fluffy, pastel colored vibe to it. And I like it for that. But I go somewhere else. I go to a quote by Nabokov who says, curiosity is insubordination in its purest form. And what I like about that is it speaks to the way that curiosity in the best possible way can disrupt the status quo, can challenge what we take for granted. And actually, if you keep pushing on that, in some ways is about disrupting power and control that opens up possibilities for everybody. That's what gets me excited about curiosity. As you said in the introduction, I've been kind of chewing over curiosity for for years, tens of years now, which makes me feel older than I probably am, or maybe not. But anyway, I actually think Uh, This is my current thinking. I think maybe two types of curiosity, two broad buckets. There's troublemaker curiosity and there's change maker curiosity. So troublemaker we've all heard of. It's that saying curiosity killed the cat. Well, it's kind of that. (laughs) It's where you, for almost selfish reasons, get nosy and kind of disrupt things. I think that's different from change maker curiosity. And I think that's what you know, the four of us on this conversation will stand for, which is the way curiosity unlocks possibilities at an individual level, for sure. It's, you know, the basis of why coaching is such an effective and important technology. It opens up possibilities. But I think curiosity as a leadership or an organizational superpower, it opens up teams, the opportunity for teams to be more effective, to be more resilient, to be more innovative, I mean, and Simon, you know this better than any of us, you know, somebody at the very heart of a a big organization, Uh what organizations care about are two things. It's like uh, productivity and impact and putting stuff out into the world and having engaged people doing it. And if you have people who are increasingly engaged, focused on the right problems and solving the right problems and serving them up to the world to solve the, the challenges that the world faces, then you have a successful organization. And I think curiosity both can nourish individuals, but also can drive effectiveness within organizations. Mark, you're talking there about how curiosity unlocks possibilities for people, individuals or leaders. What makes curiosity so powerful? And where have you seen that really work in the organizations that you've been involved with? I think one of the things that curiosity opens up is a sense of humility. (laughs) It kind of gets us out of our own way of thinking that we know everything and we can do everything and we can be everything. 
And I think if there's a, a corporate leader at the moment who best embodies that and is making that change in their organization, that's Sachin Adela at Microsoft. Mm. Uh, he's been CEO, I think, about 10 years now. And when he came in as CEO of Microsoft, honestly, Microsoft were seen as a bit of a big, boring behemoth that were just losing. <laughs> I don't know if you remember those ads between Apple and PC on the TV, but it was just like PC, which is kind of Microsoft embodied, was just mocked as being hopeless. And Microsoft made lots of money, but they were kind of seen as being hopeless compared to other organizations. And Nadella came in and said, look, we are shifting the culture here from a know-it-all culture to a learn-it-all culture. And what's been amazing about Microsoft and, you know, at Box of Crowns, we've had a chance to kind of work internally a bit and support them as part of this cultural change, is that it has been a way that has shifted their culture and shifted their business model that has allowed them to adapt, allowed them to change and evolve. So they're no longer the, you know, Balmer, the previous CEO, kind of being scathing about iPhones and saying that never going to take off. I don't think that's a good idea to actually now being a, an organization that lots of us look at going, you're at the very edge of what it means to have, uh, move into this, the 2020s with business models and with cultures and ways of showing up at work and making a difference in the world. I know from uh, Novartis' perspective, we've certainly looked at Microsoft as, as from a cultural change perspective, someone that we can learn a, a lot from. Um, and we met with yeah. them a while ago to see how they went about their cultural transformation and the notion of growth mindset in particular there uh, are right. really encouraging. I was on a session a few weeks ago with one of their leaders from Asia, and he talked about how... Um, the appetite for growth there or the importance of, of learning um, that they actually block time um, in the diary for learning so to create the space for it which is fantastic but he talked about how if meetings come in in that time actually um, you can refuse it and it's seen as important as spending time with a customer um, that your time spent learning is, is up there as one of the most important ways you can spend time and I thought that was a, a sort of small symbol of just how important learning is for, for them as a company uh, and it sounds like you've you've seen some of that journey so I'd love to hear a bit more around what, what you've seen from your involvement there Michael. Yeah you know Part of what Box of Crayons has done has been providing some of the online and in-person training to kind of operationalize what a growth mindset means because, you know, you read Carol Dweck's work and you think, oh, that's great. And then you're like, but how do you do that? <laughs> I, get, I, I get the model, but how do I shift, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of people from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset? Mm. And, you know, as, as you know, change is really hard <laughs> in organizational culture. I mean, it fails more than it succeeds. And it is a combination of persistence and small symbolic acts and longer term commitments um, to say, look, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to do it for three years until it starts getting traction. One of the most powerful moments for me was um, I was down in Las Vegas and Microsoft were having their annual sales meeting. And it's a big, big deal. Like there's thousands of people in the room. There are thousands of people beaming in from around the world. And it's that annual refocusing and resetting of sales targets for, for the organization. So it really matters. And um, I had the opportunity to come out on stage in front of these three or 4,000 people and coach the head of sales for the whole of Microsoft. So, you know, he reports directly to Satya. It was a symbolic moment for a number of reasons. The first is because um, JPC had kind of grown up in Microsoft. He had, you know, been part of Gates and under Balmer and now under Nadella. So he is very much seen as a person who came from the old world of Microsoft. He's got deep, deep roots. But what was really impressive was him being willing to have that humility and that vulnerability and that courage to be coached in front of 4,000 people. <laughs> and it wasn't, we hadn't prepared the coaching session. It was literally me getting in there and asking him some hard questions and him being willing to be seen to struggle and kind of be uncomfortable and push deeper into his own learning. And, uh, and honestly, this, this still stands as a, as a, as a, highlight i think of my kind of professional career because it was this culmination of 
20 years of work really to get to that point and to see this man willing to role model what it means to not be a know-it-all but to be committed to learn it all and to open up and be vulnerable was just essential to having you know those 4,000 people go look if JPC is up for this then I can do the learning I can commit to shifting and changing my own behavior which of course in you know it's thousands of people shifting their own behavior which is what shifts a corporate behavior a culture absolutely seen that so we have our, our unboss principle as well and um if i think back to uh, a, a year ago i saw a similar piece with our ceo going through on stage with some of our leaders a, a similarly right. very personal journey like that and i think it's it's hugely powerful to change the culture around the organization when you have leaders who are prepared to be vulnerable and you know authentic in front of uh, others and yeah a hugely powerful symbol i've seen your ceo speak a number of times and he is a wonderful embodiment of so much of what you stand for at novartis there are two things that have really grabbed me about what you're talking about michael one is we're talking about culture change which is you know how do you bring about a new culture of curiosity and why do you want to do that and you know, whenever we do any culture change of any sort we're asking people to fundamentally change the way of doing things or fundamentally change yeah. some of their beliefs or some of the things that they've been um, they've learned most of their lives so it's always it's always tense right any form of culture <laughs> change and the, the question is always you know why should i do it but the other thing you you really which struck me was you you talked briefly about hard questions so i'd, mm. I'd like to ask you two, two things like firstly Tell us more about what it takes to shift these cultures, especially around if you want to put curiosity into your organization, which we think is hugely important in the digital age. And um, and secondly, hard questions. What's that about? I mean, if I had a really fast, easy answer for how you can for sure shift a corporate culture, I'd be a wealthy man <laughs> because, because it's, it is difficult and it's complex because you're dealing with a complex system. And complex systems, by their very nature, don't respond to somebody pulling a lever and the right result popping out. And organizations, you know, their their organizing principle is homeostasis, which is we like to stay the way we are. <laughs> so exactly. when you push into it, it pushes back. So th there is no easy playbook to do culture change. It is a series of ongoing experiments where you try something out. The, the system shifts around you, you go, oh, that's interesting. Where do we go to from here? But there are definitely some necessities that are on, always required. And part of it's around having a leadership that's engaged and can role model and be the change that they're wanting the organization to see. You know, we've all seen organizations where the senior leadership goes, no, we, we think we think change is good. You should all do that. <laughs> we, we are not going to do that, but everybody else should definitely do this culture change thing. And I do think that to create culture change, it is skepticism of plans that feel too neat and too easy, um, a, a degree of resilience and a willingness to keep um, keep your plans and your your ideas evolving as the culture evolves, and a willingness to to work in small experiments whilst holding a bigger plan as to this is this is the outcome that we're going to. Part of what Microsoft's brilliance is in the way they articulate their problem is from a know-it-all culture to a learn-it-all culture. Growth mindset is the key. So we've got, yeah. we've got a destination and we've got a core principle. Very simple. And now we're going to do a, a thousand little experiments to figure out how we sustain the journey on that. And how would hard questions fit into that? You can answer that at two levels. One is you answer it at a what if you're trying to shift the culture around curi to a curious based culture, a curiously led culture, which I know, you know, the four of us all will violently agree upon the importance of. And part of our approach to making curiosity feel accessible and, and with that kind of tied up to that is often coaching because that's often the embodiment of curiosity, which is we want you to be more coach like as a as a contributor, as a manager and as a leader. It's to really unweird coaching <laughs> because coaching and curiosity as well it just comes with a whole lot of baggage and you have some people like the four of us and others kind of in maybe od and hr and learning and development who are all in we're like oh no this is amazing this is a superpower and then you've got a bunch of other people going look <laughs> i'm an i'm an engineer or i'm a scientist or i'm a marketer or i'm a salesperson that's what i do i don't want any of this 
curiosity stuff to get in the way of me trying to do my job. So you have to do a number of different things. You have to make curiosity and coaching in the service of individual growth and organizational success. But at Box of Crowns, we see the organizational outcomes for an organization that's committed to being curiosity led is empowered innovation and amplified resilience. So you're more able to, to navigate the slings and arrows of our difficult world. And you're more able to keep inventing the stuff that makes blue ocean strategy and makes you different from the people around you. If we just said, be curious for the sake of curiosity, nobody's going to buy that. Nobody's going to support that. That's right. Then at an individual level, you're like, okay, so what questions are good? When I was writing The Coaching Habit four or five years ago, I was, I'd, I'd spent 20 years collecting good questions. So I had hundreds. <laughs> my original idea was to write a book with like my favorite 181 questions in it. And I, and I wrote that book and it was a terrible book. <laughs> it was boring. It was tedious. It was repetitive. It was confusing. It was unusable. So in The Coaching Habit, what I did, and it took me quite a while to get there, was to find what I thought were the seven essential questions that if you're a manager, a leader, an individual contributor, a CEO, you could build those into the way that you worked and it would cover you for most of the situations most of the time. So, you know, if you pick one, this is the, a, a simple question, but I think I, I would call it perhaps the most essential coaching question. It's the second one in the book and it's AWE, the or question, and what else? And here's why it's so powerful. The first answer somebody gives you is never their only answer, and it's rarely their best answer. But we're also triggered to want to get on with things. That, you know, as soon as you ask a question and somebody gives you an answer, you're like, that's brilliant. Let's, let's solve it. Let's do it. Let's yeah. move on it. And, and what else is a way of self-management, what I would call taming your advice monster, so that you can stay curious a little bit longer and actually really make the most of that question and get a little bit further in the conversation. You're listening to The Curious Advantage podcast, inspired by the book, The Curious Advantage, written by Paul Ashcroft, Simon Brown, and Garrick Jones. Subscribe to the podcast today. Michael, these questions, and I know you said you have seven here, so what's on your mind? Uh, what's the real challenge for you? Uh, what do you want? Is it, if you're saying yes to this, what are you saying no to is one I, I really love because we're, we're often just asked to do more and more and more. So I guess right. that about just saying no to things as well. And what was most useful for you? When you've worked with leaders in organizations, how have you got them to sort of adopt those in a practical way uh, to use them to lead their organizations? And who have you seen do this well? Yeah, there's always a mixed bag of who does it well to take your last part first. And I always think what I'm up against is a bell curve. I have some people at the, the right-hand side of the bell curve who are kind of manically excited about this stuff. <laughs> and, you know, and like within minutes, they're using all the questions and they're, they're all working for them. And they're like, this is a miracle. On the other end of the bell curve, you've got the, the cynics who are like, look, <laughs> there's nothing you can say ever that's going to make me ask any of these questions. I'm, I'm kind of opposed to this whole idea of curiosity. I'm just going to tell people what to do. I'm not that interested in the world. I'm not that interested in people. Um, and you know, you may have seen the same research that says kind of non-curious people are the ones who are non-curious, which I know sounds kind of tautological almost, but it's like, uh, if you're not curious, it's hard to get the wheel of curiosity spinning. Yeah. The people I care about are the people in the middle of the bell curve, the ones who go, you know what? I can see that these questions might actually be helpful, but man, I'm so busy <laughs> and I've, I've gone through so much bad training before and I don't know, is it worth it? And I'm trying to tip that 40% in the middle of the bell curve and tip them right rather than left because cultural change is a game of numbers. And if I can tip the maybes towards curiosity, then I've got a chance of helping that organization evolve and grow. So in terms of how do you make people do it, well, you've got to unweird coaching. You've got to, un you've got to make this unweird for them. So you have to ask yourself, well, what gets in the way of people asking questions? Because in theory, staying curious a little bit longer, that, can't, that doesn't sound too hard, but it, it is hard for lots of people. It is hard. And there's a number of different points of resistance, and I'll rattle through them really fast. 
first thing people always say to me is, look, I don't have time for this. <laughs> I'm really busy. And, you know, if you're asking me to coach or be more coach-like, you know, um, I've seen what coaching is. It's like a 30 minute or an hour long conversation once a week. I have, there's no way I can do that with a team or individuals. And I'm like, you're, t you're right. If you can't coach in 10 minutes or less, you do not have time to coach. And then they go, Michael, amazing. Coaching in 10 minutes or less, I would love to learn that. But even if I did, I still don't have time to coach because I can't add coaching to it, on to an obligations that I already have because I am already overcommitted. I've got emails unanswered. I've got meetings that I flake out on. I'm taking work home. I'm already working all the time. I can't add coaching to what I'm currently doing. And I would say, exactly, you can't. You've got to think of this as transformative. You're transforming what you currently do, not trying to pour water into a full glass. You're trying to turn that glass of water to something else, maybe a good whiskey or something. Then people go, all right, but Michael, I don't want to be a coach because I've met coaches and they're all slightly nuts. <laughs> you know, whether it's like a executive coach or a life coach or a sports coach, I've met the outliers of those people and I just don't want to be that. Like I said before, I'm a normal person trying to do a normal job. And what we say at Box of Crowns is like, exactly. We don't want you to be a coach. We want you to be you in your role, being more coach-like. We want you to see coaching not as a profession, but as a leadership behavior. The fourth resistance is people going, all right, confession. I don't, what are we talking about here? <laughs> because coaching is one of those words that's been bandied around for 10, 20, 30 years, it has different meanings in different contexts. Nobody's quite sure what we're talking about. And, and we have a very behaviorally based definition. We say this, can you stay curious a little bit longer? Can you rush to action and advice giving a little bit more slowly? So the fourth reason people resist this is they go, okay, you're making coaching feel unweird. And I like that. But here's the thing, I don't even know what we're talking about. What do you mean by coaching? Because it's just one of those words that's been around forever, it has different meanings in different contexts. Nobody's quite sure what we're talking about. So we have a very behaviorally based definition. It's this, can you stay curious a little bit longer? Can you rush to action and advice giving a little bit more slowly? The fifth and final point of resistance is people going, okay, so you make coaching and being curious sound okay. It's not going to take a whole lot more time. It's not going to change me into something I don't want to be. I know what you're talking about. It's just staying curious a bit longer. But what's in it for me? Look, I get how this is going to help Novartis or whatever organization it might be. I get how it's going to allow my team to be more competent and more confident and more self-sufficient and more autonomous. But it's an effort to change my behavior. Why would I bother doing this? And I would say, look, here's what happens when your team is all of that and your organization is seeing what's happening. There's a good chance that you get to work a little less hard, but have more impact in the work that you do. And if that at least sounds interesting to you to work less hard, but have more impact in the work that you're doing, then getting curious about curiosity might be a useful thing for you to do. Very actionable, and I personally can see uh, there's some things there that are, that I should be uh, applying as well in my own behaviour. <laughs> so <laughs> we've all got something to learn. Um, I'd like to come back to um, something you said earlier, Michael. So um, you talked about the, the value of curiosity for organisational success and how it mm. empowers innovation and organisational resilience. And this may be a bit of a leading question, I guess, but but why do you think this or curiosity is, is sort of becoming more talked about now and why maybe now it's more important than ever? My My theory, Simon, is... It's where there are just lots of us bumping up against the limits of our own capacity and the limits of our own knowledge. I mean, it's an interesting question to ask. What do we? What? What? What's the? What's your definition of curiosity? And I realize I, I don't actually have a great definition. Um, I suspect it's a bit like the definition of coaching. There's a thousand definitions, none of which are quite satisfactory. I often think that it's it's marked by a humility a willingness to say, I might not know all the answers. I might not know all the answers about myself. I might not know all the answers about that other person across the table from me or through the Zoom screen from me. 
I might not know all the answers to how to solve this team challenge or this business unit challenge or this organizational challenge. And it's that willingness to be grounded in humility that allows curiosity to happen. I think that as our world only gets more complex, we realize that behavior that keeps trying to lock things down and control them just has a limitation. I remember um, reading the, the Harvard Business Review article, you know, was it a year ago or a year and a half ago about curiosity, talking about why leaders resist it. And they're like, well, it increases the chance of risk and inefficiency, even though they often, I mean, there's a great gap. Leaders, if you're a senior leader, you're, you probably think that curiosity happens in your organization. If you're in the organization, you probably think it doesn't happen. That's what the research points to. Leaders resist curiosity because they're like, I'm, I'm afraid of losing control. I'm afraid of there's an increase of risk and there's an increase in inefficiency. And here's what's ironic. I think they're right. <laughs> I think that's what curiosity does. But I also think that it's by allowing more risk in and allowing appropriate inefficiency in that allows organizations to change and evolve and grow and adapt. A curious culture is a game changer. What does curiosity mean for you? Follow hashtag curious advantage and join the conversation. You're speaking my language, Michael. I really um, get excited about this because I think the, the definition of risk is changing because right. what the digital world is doing for organizations is it's changing the way that we have worked in history. And we talk about this in the book, you know, from command and control, where everything right. is homeostasis, as you say, and you want repeatability. And the thing about risk in that situation is you're driving out anything that diverges from that. Whereas in the new world, we have you know, infinite um, access to each other and to information and knowledge um, in theory. And that's destabilizing to those old-style organizations. Mm -hmm. And risk in this situation becomes not having enough information that allows you to shift and to move and to mutate and evolve quickly enough to meet the shifting and changing world that's happening around you with your... Right. Uh, your clients and your sponsors and your uh, anybody involved in your organization um, and outside and in the market. It's all changing now in a way, and we have to respond to that. So our notion of risk is uh, changing. I think if you're not curious in your organization, you're actually creating more risk because we know right. that um, by being curious and having curious individuals, you're op opening up the options and the scenarios that are, are available to you. Um, your right. books have sold over a million copies. I know. Um, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I mean they, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful book, that. And you talk about three advice monsters. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your advice monsters? Sure. I mean, it taps, it's, a, it's a lovely segue to what we're talking about because the three advice monsters are in the kind of context of why people find it hard to stay curious longer, but they speak to a bigger, kind of the three bigger drivers that – make us anxious about curiosity. So the three advice monsters, tell it, save it, control it. So tell it is, you know, tell it, if you imagine it as a, a little advice monster, tell it is convincing you that the only way you add value is to have the answers. In fact, you need to have all the answers to all the questions and all the problems. And if you don't have all the answers to all the questions, then you're failing and you're enabling others to fail as well. Now, of course, as soon as I say it in that kind of slightly melodramatic way, you realize how impossible that is <laughs> because um, you just can't have all the answers. And honestly, if you think you've got all the answers, you're just deluded. Um, the only answers you've got that are probably right are ones that I can look up faster on Google anyway. But there's, there's, there's prizes and punishments to each of these patterns of behavior. And there's a prize to being talent, which is like, this is how I add value. This is how I stamp my authority. This is how I prove that I have, you know, I still got it. Even though I'm getting older, I still got it. But with tell it, there's the punishment of A, you becoming the bottleneck. Secondly, you trying to solve the wrong problem because you've been seduced into thinking that the first challenge is the real challenge. It almost never is. Thirdly, um, your answers aren't that great. 
Um, and fourthly, just um, how exhausting it is to carry the burden of going, I need to know everything. Yeah. You really see this when people move into a managerial role for the first time and they're like, oh, <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing before I got promoted. Now I've been promoted and I need to know what I'm doing. And you can feel the anxiety that's coming there. So tell us number one. Number two is save it. So save it kind of puts its arm around you and goes, hey, it's your job to make sure that nobody ever struggles or stumbles or fails or finds it difficult or feels under tension or feels under pressure. You've got to rescue everybody. You've got to rescue everybody from everything all the time. If you don't protect everybody from everything, then you fail and you're enabling others to fail. Again, when I put it in a melodramatic way, it's like you realize how impossible that is. But lots of us carry this weight, which is it's my job to keep everybody safe. And I've got to, I've got to keep out uncertainty and I've got to keep out chaos and I've got to protect. Now there's a benefit to that behavior, short-term benefit often, you know, you feel important, you feel like you're the savior, you feel like you're appreciated, you got your fingers in everybody else's pie. So that kind of feels good, but there's a price you pay. You stop people learning, you stop people growing, rescuers create victims. Um, and, uh, and you're, you've set yourself an impossible task. So you're exhausted trying to save everybody whilst not actually doing your own work, the work that really matters. And then the third and final of the advice monsters, you've got tell it, you've got save it. The third one is control it. It's kind of the sneakiest of the three, but it says, hey, your job is to maintain control at all time. <laughs> Keep your hands on the steering wheel. Don't be letting other people lean in. Don't let the chaos of outside come in manage everything from the start through the middle to the finish only by staying in control where you stave off future uh, of failure now benefit of course is you feel like you're in control you have high status you feel safe but what you lack what the punishment is not only the disempowerment of those around you which is not an insignificant thing but you you lack or you eliminate the serendipity of the future, the serendipity of curiosity. So each of those three advice monsters, they have short term wins, but longer term costs that we're trying to understand because by understanding the resistance, you're more likely to at least open yourself up to the gift of staying curious. Fascinating. I think we, uh, we would all agree on that on, on this call uh, in our book we have a whole chapter uh, around the the curious leader and right. um certainly i think one of the things that we learned from writing that chapter and doing the research around that that essentially as you say to some extent is about letting go it's about mm -hmm. letting go of some of these old models and the need to be uh, in charge the need to be the traditional boss need to be the person with all the answers Instead, perhaps just being the person with the best questions, uh, yeah. <laughs> which is a much more comfortable place to be. Well, right. it's, you know, for some people, they get that immediately. And there's a way that they immediately go, this is the leader I've been seeking to become all my life. And they, and they embrace that. And Simon, I'm sure you see that in Nevada all the time. You've got some people who, you know, mm -hmm. they say that, that great quote from Alvin Toffler, the future is here. It's just unevenly distributed. They're already your future. They're already yeah. doing that. But there's also a lot of people who are like, I don't want to give, I don't want to give up control. I don't want to give up status. I don't want to not have the answer and only have the question. And that's where the the, the interesting work often is. Yeah, no, it's a it's a journey that many of us are on um, in terms of yeah, how do we become better leaders and let go of some of these things that hold us back? Mm -hmm. So I can can definitely relate to that. Michael, you seem a very curious person yourself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are you currently most curious about? I am trying to have a better understanding of complexity and how once you see the world as a complex system, it changes the way how you think about change and it changes the way you think about power and control. Mm. And I'm trying to learn about power. I mean, I think 2020 has disrupted all number of things, you know, amongst other things, <laughs> how confident are you about being certain around stuff? Because uh, whatever your plan was at the start of 2020, it's not your plan now. Um, but, you know, with things like Black Lives Matter and the like, and I'm a straight, white, overeducated, English-speaking man in Canada, 
I get to, I basically get dealt all the, all the privilege cards. And so I am really interested to ask myself, what does it take to allow power to be shared or given away? Um, how does power work? Because so often power rumbles along below the surface. We don't really talk about it. You know, you look at a Novartis org chart and you go, does this tell me how power works in Novartis? Well, not really. Um, so it's like, how does power work? And I think that's that's a learning piece for me, in part because it keeps challenging me around what power do I hold that I'm unconscious about. I think if you can crack that one, then uh, that's a many million seller book uh, in there. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we've covered some some fantastic areas from you know, points of resistance to curiosity as troublemaker or change maker to culture and the complex system and, and advice monsters. From all of those things, if there's one thing that our listeners should take away, you know, what, what would that be or, or what tips would you have for them to become more curious? Well, I'm definitely not going to give anybody advice on what they should take away from a podcast. It feels like it would be <laughs> anti-curiosity. But I will ask I will ask the question that that is the seventh question in the coaching habit book, and it's the learning question. And it's a really powerful question to ask at the end of any uh, interaction, whether you're listening to a podcast or you're in conversation with somebody. And it's to ask every listener, well, what was most useful or most valuable here for you? And I'm asking that because I know by asking it, it forces you to make connections in your brain that you might not otherwise make. And I'm making this podcast more of a valuable experience for you. I'm also, because I'm a fellow podcaster, so I know the importance of this. If you're now thinking to yourself, actually, there was something useful or valuable about this conversation, well, then I'd encourage you to go to you know Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or wherever and write a review for the podcast saying, this episode's particularly awesome. This is what I learned from it. You should listen to it too. Because if you're running a podcast, a little bit of love from the listeners is always really appreciated. So take what's most useful or most valuable, share it with yourself, and then share it on a review. I love that. And I think uh, we need to build that into our close on the future shows, actually. I think that that's great. Um, and we always love love feedback from our listeners. So what a, a great way to close. So thank you so much for joining us, Michael. My pleasure. Simon, Garrick and Paul, thank you so much for having me along today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Curious Advantage podcast. The Curious Advantage book is now available to purchase on Amazon. Stay tuned for the next episode and keep exploring curiously. This podcast is produced by Aliki Palinelli and John McGinty and edited by Jill Damatak-Futter. <laughs>